Are you ready? <laughs> um, I think so. Um, the first pass through the text, yes, definitely. Um, the uh, examples with torch, probably. <laughs> um, but, um, well, we're fortunate. This is an introductory text, right? It is just an introduction. And um, this chapter is a little overwhelming because there's so much more to know. There are so many more books and papers. And, and in a way, we'll just scratch the surface, just, just the top. And uh, um, in an hour, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's useful. It's a useful framing. It's a useful text. Um, but uh, um, it's, it's almost as if this should lead to other courses, other, other much, much more um, uh, detailed courses. Yeah, but it's good for to, to have an idea of the argument and even, even to understand the maths. Because if you if you think about the maths, then you understand a bit better of the things that uh, happening uh, inside the new uh, artificial neural network. Uh, yeah. That I I think that um, that would be needed more uh, examples. Could be, yeah. We'll we'll get into yeah. some of that. Um, um, Even if I, they they provide uh, um, two ways to do the things. You can use Kiras, you can use Torch and everything. But uh, as, as you have seen, the syntax is very articulate. So if you don't, it's good if you practice, if you have um, some practice, um, so you, you need to do the things and go there and understand all the things and how you can manage. So it's uh, another syntax language for making this neural network. Maybe it would be needed like a function which reassume everything and you can use that uh, for, that, that would be uh, better. Because here it's, yeah. Something I've observed among people that, that I know that work in, in deep learning, um, they, they use the abstractions like Keras, like, like you said, and, and they seem to be less concerned about the math or the statistics. They've, they've, they've managed to make the magic work and they accept the black box. So they're, they're really not looking at the math. Um, and, and maybe that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But um, there are um, other fields of, of investigation of inquiry. Um, so so th though there are people that go down the deep learning rabbit hole, they, they haven't necessarily done the other chapters of this book, I guess is, <laughs> is maybe, they're, they're not necessarily connected um, or only loosely connected, at, at least what I see at work in, on the industry side. And uh, um, I do wonder for, for the future, for how this is taught and how, how books are, are written. Um, you know, we want the math to get it all, but um, um, when, when people are under pressure, you know, in a hurry to, to get a model out, um, they, they use the abstraction. They, push it through Keras to get a training result. You know, they 
pick the set of hyperparameters and and they push it to production. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And and EDA and the inferential stuff that we talked about earlier, um, um, they're there, but they're not uh, emphasized. So I, I hope this say overview. Hello, Ricardo. Hello, everyone. I, I I hope this Ricardo is I, I hope I, I hope this review is um, uh, 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 just just a just a, a a quick you know an hour overview of the landscape. In fact, um, we're we're a minute early, but is it okay if I share my screen? We could we could start. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me see if I can remember how to do this. Share screen, screen one, share. Okay, um, is it coming through? Yes. Fantastic. All right. So yeah, I've, I've not pushed this to the, to the, R4DS site yet, but I will when we're done and we have a YouTube link. So in in this hour, um, we'll cover the introductory material, the 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 really high level stuff on um, the the sections of Chapter Ten uh, with a, a single layer. Uh, well, it's it's I guess a neural network, but it's not deep because it's just a single layer. Uh, then we'll add layers. Uh, we'll talk about convolutions, so adding um, steps and and what that means, and then uh, uh, introduce recurrent neural, neural networks. Um, some notes about com comparing these deep learning techniques as a family versus the 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 models we'd seen in prior chapters. Uh, and and where a practitioner would spend their time in one or the other. Um, we'll recognize the process by which neural networks are fit. So, so when we do the training, how, how is a neural network uh, de determining what all the parameter weights are? And then finally, we'll, we'll close with uh, unique double descent phenomenon. Um, to keep this within an hour, um, th there's a lot of other really, really great materials to, to uh, for example, to, to look at convolutional neural nets. There's, there's some fantastic resources, but I, I didn't list those. I, I only, you know, uh, linked here to um, the author slides for chapter 10. Um, uh, there's a fun link to the to, to the TensorFlow Playground to um, to try some of these techniques on dummy data sets and watch, you know, visualize how the training is happening. So to look at the inner workings of how some of these network um, architectures work, and then uh, if we have some time at the end of the the text. Um, we, we could start looking at um, the examples. Um, I, I have Torch set up, works great. Um, anyway, I, I, I guess if, if we in this hour can get, say, the book chapters, I, I, I think that's a good goal. I, I guess, what are your thoughts? Is that all right? Uh, yeah, go for it. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so... In a single layer neural network, um, which is a little bit deceiving, but a, a single layer neural network has one hidden layer. The, the input doesn't count. These are um, like the pixels in an image or the, the, uh, uh, these are the actual values um, that we considered layers here. And at the hidden layer um, in a simple feed forward neural network, um, in, in this case, uh, we're imagining there are four predictors or, or uh, say every image has four points. Um, 
And in this case, it's got five uh, nodes in the hidden uh, layer. Every, every node in the hidden layer has an activation function, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then, and then the output layer, again, is not part of the network per se. This is, this is where the answer or the, the prediction shows up. So um, single layer means one, one hidden layer in the sandwich. Um, they note here, uh, the authors have quite a bit of history in the, in the text that I won't repeat, but um, they do envision that these connections are analogous to neurons in the brain. And when the values of the activation functions um, are, are close to firing, um, that the value that's transmitted is, is, has some higher weight and, and those close to zero that don't fire are silent. Um, they, they note here that ReLU, um, the rectified linear unit, this, this uh, function that is, is zero for, for negative values of input and then a slope of one. So it is literally Z for values over zero. Um, this is, this is the, the, the most popular activation function now in part because it's so easy to calculate. It just for positive values of Z returns Z. In, in the past, sigmoids and tan H and other functions had been used, but uh, ReLU realizes, uh, we'll talk about the benefits in a moment. Um, in fact, here, the, the sum of two nonlinear transformations of linear functions can provide the model with um, interactions. So this, this discovery that uh, rather than engineering features for interactions, we can just feed the features into the model and the uh, combinations of layers, e even with one layer. But, but if you add a second layer and a third layer, the, the model will discover interactions between the features. And, and it's pretty powerful, say, way of thinking of... Um, you know, what the potential of deep learning is. But fitting a neural network requires estimating, we'll, we'll discover here, uh, hundreds or even thousands of unknown parameters because every, every, node, has, every node has a slope and combinations of nodes have a, a, have a bias. So uh, large neural networks have, have lots of unknown parameters. So for a, for a quantitative node, no, uh, final node, um, if, if what we're looking for in the end is a regression, um, loss functions like squared error are, are um, used so that as a network trains, the, the, the squared error is, is uh, say, minimized. The search is for parameters that yield a, a, the smallest possible squared error loss. Um, for a qualitative response, uh, We'll, we'll talk about cross entropy, uh, a way of minimizing um, the the number of wrong answers in uh, either either binomial or uh, you know a multi class output. Okay, so with that introduction, um, we'll we'll add some complexity. We'll look at multi layer neural networks. And in this case, uh, the example they highlight here, and I think the one a lot of us encounter um, in books, coursework, just generally in places is MNIST, this uh, set of grayscale images. They're 28 by 28 pixels with uh, 60,000 training examples and 10,000 test samples. They're all labeled zero through nine. So, um, but given that they're handwriting, they, they vary a lot. And uh, the pixels, every image has 784 pixels. And each of those 784 pixels has a grayscale value between zero and 255. Um, so um, 
for for training on MNIST, it's it's possible to look at GLM or XGBoost, but um, they're obviously uh, there's there's a there's a lot going on here. Um, so what what they've done here is proposed a a multi-layer um, neural network, a, a deep learn a deep learning neural network. Um, what they're showing here on the output is is literally the digit predicted. So it would be uh, you know 10, 10 buckets. So every one of these images has to be classified in in one of ten buckets on the output layer. The input layer, there's this dot, dot, dot. It, it is literally uh, 784 inputs. So every pixel lined up end to end as, as 784 inputs. And we would stream through this neural network every single image, calculate the, well, in this case, the cross entropy, the, 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 the erroneousness of this and uh, propagate back through the network, uh, uh, say the adjustment that needs to make to lessen the cross entropy, the erroneousness. Can, can I to... just interrupt you for, for, for a second? Yes. My, un my understanding of this thing, okay, completely different, it's completely different. So I, um understood that this input layer is the number in this case of the the digits is the number of digits so like from zero to nine the output why, why is not so the the output is zero through nine mm. what we're predict the what we're predicting is is one of say 10 dummy variables zero through nine okay but I, uh, okay, okay, yeah. Because I have this image with all these pixels. Uh, so more lines that goes from zero to nine. Okay, so each number is a pixel, no. Well, a pixel, so- The I'm, number composes the more, more, of more pixels. Yeah, so the input, Mm. is is literally 784 numbers so mm. x1 is a number between 0 and 255 in okay. in each pixel position uh. so the input uh. layer is each pixel position mm. okay where, where, that's where for is for it? each image uh jim mm. that's where, right where, so so each each image is a row in this data set. Right, I, right. I, I, I thought it was like, <laughs> like very simple, no? Let's say I draw a zero, let, let, let's say this. I, or I have an image with a zero. Yep. So let, let's say this, no? And this goes through some hidden layers with function to identify the different shapes a zero can take. Okay, and then the output says it is zero. Okay. Well, and, because... and we're, we're jumping ahead, but um, there's some better graphics when we get to convolutional neural networks. There are some um, illustrations of how this work works. And the fact that TensorFlow Playground is a pretty good um, uh, uh, illustration. So let's 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 finish um, say this segment and step over to the TensorFlow Playground, mm -hmm. if if you don't mind. Okay. So um, yeah. Um, just so the graphic they're describing here, and this is taken directly from the text. Um, this neural net has seven hundred eighty four of these orange dots. L1, so A1 here is steps it down to 256 units. L2 steps it down to 128 units. And the last layer is 10. So, 
784, 256, 128, 10. And, and those are deliberate choices before, before the, before the um, model is trained, the, the, uh, the machine learning practitioner uh, needs to choose the, the, the structure of the layers and the nature of the connections. Um, they do note here that the 10 variables on the outside are, are uh, well, effectively dependent, that if it's a one, it's not a four. Um, there, there, is a, there is a relationship between them. And they also note here, um, they bring in a term they call softmax for multi-class classification because um, uh, what, what we're gonna yield on the back end here is a set of column probabilities, they're all numbers, and, and the one with the highest softmax probability is the winner and everyone else is set to say zero uh, or, or so if, if, it's, if it's identified to be a zero, then all the other ones are identified as not zero. But at, at least initially in softmax, they show up as, as you know, everyone as a number. We'll see this in the TensorFlow Playground in a minute. So they do the tally in there. Uh, I didn't repeat it, but every every one of the weights uh, for these arrows, and and then the bias with the layers yields two hundred thirty five thousand one hundred forty six parameters. Um, and in the text, they cover how that's done when when you start with seven hundred eighty four. So it, it essentially every arrow connection for seven hundred eighty four into 256 into 128 into 10. Um, they introduce a question or a, a comment here to train this, which we'll talk about in a, in a later section. Um, since the response is a category, it's qualitative, um, we're going to actually use a negative multinomial log likelihood, but, but Everybody in the in 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 the world calls that a cross entropy. So um, that log likelihood cross entropy value, uh, like we said before, is a is a um, uh, it's not like one hot encoding where there's one class that's zero. It 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 literally will distribute the probabilities amongst all the digits and. Um, um, and then, and then compare which, which one's got the highest number. They make a note here, um, this, this guy, even with two hidden layers, um, is guaranteed to overfit. It's, it's going to find interactions in the training data that don't exist in test. Uh, it, it just requires regularization, some means of, uh, of effectively either smoothing or dropping out points so that um, you don't overfit and, and um, um, go beyond what, what you know, unseen or test data will see. Um, in the example they run on MNIST, like what we'd seen in a prior chapter, they, they run what, what amounts to the same as rig, ridge regularization, which we saw in uh, Glimnet uh, in, in GLM back in chapter six. And then we'll, we'll talk in a moment. There's a illustration about dropout regularization. There's more to come in a second. Uh, have, have either of you seen the TensorFlow Playground? Ah, uh, let's, um, let's, no. let's get no. This let's will be go. the first time. Yeah. Let, let's go mess with the TensorFlow Playground. Great. So it's it's literally at playground.tensorflow.org. And and literally here, you you mess with a neural network right in your browser. Um, you can't break it. And you go ahead and play with it yourself. 
we'll we'll pick a data set. Um, in fact, let's yeah, let's let's pick this one. That's a classification problem. We'll use uh, Relu. Let's uh, we'll go with one hidden layer. Um, so so we're going to feed in a pattern that looks like that. Um, and, and try to build a classifier. Uh, we'll, we'll feed in a learning rate, ReLU activation. We'll say no regularization at first, uh, so it doesn't need a rate. And we'll hit play. And almost immediately, you see the loss function and the epics over time as it's training. It's going through, you know, hundreds of epics. I'll hit pause, but you can see in the image how the model has arrived at a fit for that data set you know given that learning set that activation function that regularization and and that number of hidden layers um, they have this interesting feature here you can you can introduce noise um, try it again and again, in 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 a hundred or so epics, this this quickly arrives at say the the, the best possible um, model for classifying data that that looks like that. Uh, Jim, um, I could, could you post the the link in the chat so it stays in the log? Yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, I'll be playing with this this weekend, you know. <laughs> uh, how do I? I, I, I always am attracted to this simulation in uh, graphics, okay? So that, you know, because if, if you're visual, you know, it tells you a lot in terms of the the mechanism and the and what, what, what it's doing and the, and, the, and the different results depending on uh, different parameters, right? <laughs> yes. So let's let's take a complicated data set. Um, so here's here's one that um, maybe a support vector machine would handle better, but but let's let's see with one hidden layer for classification. Um, in fact, let's let's go ahead and add some L1 or ridge regression and a little bit of a regularization rate. Let's let's see how many epics it takes to train that guy. We get it started and and you see over time what the loss function is and and how it's arriving at a a model to to distinguish the the blue dots from the orange dots um, so for for different data sets even the spiral which is just a little bit crazy um, you can see this single layer neural network struggles to arrive at uh, a low training loss where we're, we've still got a relatively high number and it's it's flatlined so for for something like this spiral you may need a second layer and we can run that and it's still struggling so maybe we need to uh bring in other properties. What, one second, guys. Let's see if I can. Sorry. Sorry about that. All right. So in any case, I, I, I leave you all to uh, uh, you know play or tinker with the TensorFlow playground as 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 you like. So I gotta go back.
Okay. All right. Um, moving forward then, the kind of the fun stuff. So on top of the uh, 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 say the, the additional layers and the activation functions and the size of the layers, um, and what we've seen so far has everything fully connected. So every node is connected to every node. Um, the, there are other techniques to add that uh, help a great deal to um, classify images and video. And uh, one of the um, assertions made in the text is that um, these math techniques do mimic some degree how humans will classify what we see um, by recognizing uh, sub patterns that exist within the image. Um, so in the, in, the, in the author's slides, they refer to uh, this image. They, they actually get this from cartooning for kids, but um, uh, what they're saying is for an image like, like uh, you know, a cat's face, it can be broken up into individual elements, arcs and uh, uh, shapes, and that uh, our neural network with, with, with enough layers will effectively combine those elements into uh, 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 combinations of features that yield the prediction of, in this case, tiger. Um, so the the one one of the ways or one of the uh, features added to a a, a deep learning system uh, is a is a new kind of layer. Um, we'll call it a convolution, and, and then a separate, usually after there's a convolution, there's a pooling layer. The, the convolutions literally uh, walk across the image and, and do some sort of math transformation. Um, so in this case, um, it, it multiplies a rolling window of the matrix el elements and, and adds the results of the multiplication to make the convolved feature. Um, th there are different kinds of convolution layers, uh, some that uh, yield like horizontal features and, and others that yield uh, vertical features. So you, you can have different kinds of convolution layers it's not unusual for an image to apply the convolutions to the, the red channel, the blue channel, and the green channel. So um, uh, what, what might seem to be something that would, that would add a, a massive number of parameters actually uh, ends up reducing parameters be, because they, they, it yields a smaller uh, uh, layer. And then with the pooling, you usually shrink everything by a, a factor of two. Um, here's a good ex illustration of, of, say, that initial tiger, and and then the convolutions that pick off the, say, the the, the vertical lines that get moved through, and and a different convolution that picks off the horizontal lines. Um, it says they typically apply the, the ReLU function to the convolved image. Um, this step is sometimes viewed as a separate layer in the neural network and, and people will refer to it as a detector layer. That is the, the, um, the ReLU convolution yields just the, uh, you know, the, the subset of the image that is that uh, um, you know, specific artifact. 
So were there a number of possible ways to perform the pooling, the, the max pooling operation, but which is really the only one I've ever seen. Um, it, it summarizes each non-overlapping two by two blocks in an image using the maximum value in that two by two value. So um, for a color image broken into its color layers, um, this, this is typical where, where the convolutions happen at, at the original resolution, uh, a pool layer and each color channel cuts that down in half. And then there's another convolution layer, another pooling layer, again, for every channel, another convolution layer, another pooling layer, and then what amounts to a, a, a flattening where they're all stacked into um, uh, uh, a one last, uh, say, square or maximum value. All right, let's see, what do we wanna? They mentioned flattening here and the soft max for, in, in this data set, what they're talking about is a hundred labeled classes. So every every image in, in this chapter's data set, I didn't mention the data set, but um, they've got a, a subset of like the ImageNet data set where the stack of images are, are, are labeled into a hundred different classes. Um, they mention here also that as a preprocessor, as, as every image comes in, it's normal also to uh, run an augmentation scheme where the image is twisted and flipped and reversed. Um, in, in a random way uh, so, so that in the training data, every one image is, is actually many multiples of image reoriented or, or flipped or distorted in just a little bit in a, in a way. So uh, the, the CNN works in big batches with, with images and altered versions of that image on the fly. So there's there's no need to store these. They they just are introduced to the neural net um, uh, through the preprocessor this way. And then they close the chapter by talking about a pre-trained CNN or convolutional neural net classifier. So uh, using ResNet. Um, there, there, there are uh, available pre-trained convolutional neural nets that have uh, all of the weights down to the to the end for for thousands of subjects, and and ResNet is one. Um, there are others, um, but the the uh, it's it's possible to take a pre-trained classifier CNN and append um, just the last couple layers, you know, and, and lock in the, the, the pre-trained layers and, and just retrain on the end for the images that you care about. So for models that, that uh, fit with like ImageNet, the output of those filters can serve as features for um, let's say other natural image classifications problems. And, and that, that saves uh, uh, days and days of training where, where you can do it on a, on a relatively modest computer with new, just a small amount of new data. Okay, um, questions on the CNN introduction? We'll, we'll move next to RNNs, which is a whole different animal than a tiger. Okay. Um, oh, just briefly, they, they, they do talk about document classification, which, which um, getting beyond the pictures, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a tangent that 
Um, you can use a neural net to classify documents like, uh, you know, in this illustration here, the type of ticket or the type of uh, maybe issue in a chat bot, you know, is the issue a refund or a, a complaint issue or a login issue. And, and, and they mention here that in language models, um, outside of neural nets, bag of words models, where every word is weighted um, equally independent of its location in the document, um, that's, that's, that's really common. And, and you're really stuck with a bag of words model with a, with a really sparse matrix because uh, you're using a, a, say, dictionary. Um, uh, that's that's very common. In in a moment, we'll see a way to get past bag of words. But um, they 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 mention here in document classification that um, just by looking at the words and in the document and and making a matrix on your dictionary, um, um, you you can try to classify documents, but there's there's some things you could do to make a better classification. Um, they mentioned two things in this section. Um, one is to do an n-grams model. So you, you take the words in the document, you you make the bag of words, but but then you then you do two grams or three grams, and you associate the words with one another in there in that say position next to a, one or two adjacent words. So something like blissfully long would be seen as a positive phrase in a movie review where blissfully short maybe could be seen as a negative. Um, and then what we'll talk about in a minute is, is to treat the whole document as a sequence of words and, and to train on a sequence. Um, I, I guess, did I lose you here? I, I tried to simplify it. Uh, precisely, uh, Jim, uh, my comment, but I was going to do it at the end, but maybe this is a good, uh, you know, a good timing, is that usually, uh, you know, uh, deep learning models do very well, for example, classifying images, yeah. and also, and also uh, you know, doing uh, NLP. Uh, natural language process, okay? Because some of this, you know, back of words, uh, you know, term, term uh, uh, frequency, uh, T, T, I, T, I, T, D, F. Uh, T, F, I, D, F, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, usually uh, they don't, they have trouble understanding the context, okay? Of what that particular word is used. And usually deep learning, with a lot of data, of course, you know, that's one of the things that we need, you know, we need, as you can see, most of this, those data says that we have the pre-trained models, they have, you know, millions and millions of, uh, of items. So it, it, it's tasking, you know, to, to work on, on, on this, on this uh, you know, on, on, the, on these models, you know, a, a laptop, I don't think will suffice, you know, you have to go to the cloud or to, yep. you know, or, or to a, 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 a nice, you know, resource, uh, you know, to get that. But uh, in, in the NLP also, I see that there's a lot of progress, especially in pre-trained pre models. For example, uh, uh, helping uh, 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 doctors uh, diagnose you know, a, a patient based on the history and also based on everything that the documents you know, can portray in terms of that particular uh, setting. Usually a human doesn't have the capacity but a machine does because it can see their, those relationships. And usually deep learning is very, very good. I was thinking about that, uh, you know, the, I don't know if you remember the IBM Watson oh, okay, yes, of uh, course. project. Uh, yeah, I yeah. bet, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know the, 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 the inner details, but I bet, you know, they were doing some kind of uh, deep learning, uh, you know, getting all these, you know, amounts of data and then try to, you know, uh, uh, you know, try, try to search for patterns for patterns in, in, in all that, those documents. Yeah. So, I mean, th those are the two things because in, in tabular data, uh, deep learning is, has, hasn't been the, you know, the, the holy grail. 
Okay, for example, in tabular data, the, the one that we're used to it, uh, usually, you know, a, a gradient boost model, even around the forest, you know, will suffice. Okay, and that's part of the complexity of it. But in terms of imaging and natural language processing, I think deep learning really has there. You know, so, has, has, has a lot to offer. Has a lot to offer. And, and, and you raised some, some good points. I think, um, so when we step into the next chapter, we, we begin to answer the question how um, and you're right the 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 language patterns in the corpus you know in the I don't know it, it, it could be a medical corpus or uh, uh, you know technical knowledge objects in a, in a 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 certain area that the the way our languages work the the positions of the phrases do matter so the, the additional power in terms of predictive power comes from leveraging uh, what can be gleaned from the sequences of words rather than just the bag of words. So I, I, you're, you're exactly right. There's, there's so much happening. And um, so in the next section, uh, we'll, we'll just touch on the, uh, say the beginning um, but I, I think they include this section uh, just just to say in in the uh, you know up up until now every everything we've done can only look at uh, a sparse matrix bag of words. We're, we're now going to introduce a a technique that's able to take a stream of words and consider like in time series where the position of each word or letter or or, or phrase is. Okay, so they they introduce this phrase recurrent neural networks. Um, <laughs> I I don't know that I like the name, but 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 it's operating on a sequence of data where each point in time is its own. Um, uh, data set, um, and and so the 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 order of the words matters. So they they point out in here book and movie reviews, uh, newspaper articles, even tweets, where the the sequence and relative positions of the words in the document do capture some meaning that that only can be exploited this way. Um, they also point out. Uh, time series there's there's uh, uh, the, the 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 way you do time series for temperature or rainfall the, the the most meaningful point is 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 the the one just a minute or hour ago or yesterday and and time series earlier than that are are, are weighted somewhat less and the the uh, recurrent neural network handles um, the time series very well. Um, financial, where you've got regressors like trading volumes and stock and bond prices, and and there's an example we'll look at uh, eventually that deals with trading volumes. Um, you mentioned uh, speech chatbots, even music. There's there's good ways of predicting the type of music using RNNs, where the sequence of the notes matters and it's just not a bag of notes. And then uh, handwriting. Um, so <laughs> this uh, Jim, is- uh, ju ju Just a comment. Uh, yeah. It's interesting that uh, in, 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 the, in the field of music, uh, there's some AI, some, some you know, AI's algorithm that they can compose you know a piece of music in the style of a composer yeah okay? so for again. example you know they have they, they have done yeah. you know like for example you know how would you know just give it give it some random notes right give it some random notes in like a seed and then let's say you know how would bach you know will compose uh this 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 music with this series of notes and let me tell you it's it's pretty remarkable Okay, yeah. because you know the style, the phrasing, the tempo, they're all incorporated there. Okay. Maybe it won't be exactly as 
Bach would do it, right? You know, because you know, there's always some something randomness in 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 that sense. But yeah, you know, there has been some research on that on algorithms that can mimic and and produce new music based on that style of composing. That that's yeah. that's pretty pretty neat, right? <laughs> I, I think so too. So <laughs> I I um I stared at this graphic. Um, uh, quite a bit, and I, I think I understand it. Um, so, as as before, the the x's are a, a sequence of vectors, and and what's in the x could could be three dimensional. It, it could be um, it could have a lot of dimensions, but but there there is a a chunk of data at this point in usually time or in at this point of the sequence that that gets fed in. Um, there, there is is one or more, say, say hidden layers with an activation, uh, like like Relu, tech typically, and um, <laughs> each activation function has as its input an input from the prior um, set of data. So. Not, not only do you do you have as an input your your new data each time, but you have a as an input. Um, it's like your autocorrelations. Your 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 last model influences your next model to to create the output. And the way they've drawn this, it, it either could be shown as a feedback loop, or or even better, um, they show this sequence here. What, what they're essentially saying here is that hidden layer with its input from the, the prior layer and the new data yields an output, um, which could be um, like, like we said, um, a document class or uh, uh, um, time series prediction. Most often, the the why that we predict that we care about is the next one, <laughs> the one we haven't yet predicted. But it, but it could be said that in in all these other cases, we're predicting something that's already happened. So we get an error function for for all of these. And so among the weights, you you've got the weights on the new data coming in, but you've also got this sort of weight on the amount of influence from the prior sequence, if that makes sense, and then a bias for the output. So- uh, Sorry, Jim, is this the case when le uh, it, it, the model learns from the- Well, yeah, yeah, yes. So to train this, the, the tensor, the, uh, the way data flows in would be, you know, each vector over time comes in as a sequence and the influence of, of the prior sequence through the training um, is, is trained um, as, as, it, as it runs, yes. Okay, so they mention here sequential models back for do document classification. Um, and this adds a layer of sophistication, a little bit like CNNs do, that in, instead of using that single large sparse bag of words matrix, um, a sequence of words in a document is, is um, often to reduce dimensionality, they, they use a technique called embedding which is in itself a neural network um, that takes uh, this, this one hot encoded sparse matrix and condenses it, it down into uh, values, columns of values that speak to the relationships of words and, and how far they are from one another. To, to go down to a much lower dimensional embedding space. 
so, so if we have a large corpus of labeled documents, first you can have a neural network that learns E, the embedding space, as part of the optimization. So the, think of the colors here are as uh, numeric values that speak to how far each of these words are away from other words in in this case, five-dimensional vector space instead of the thousands of dimensions of vector space. And, and then with the numeric embeddings, then you can train uh, a, a predictive model. Um, the reason they mention this is like with convolutional neural nets, they're also pre-computed embedding layers that you can use. Um, Two of them that are available are Glove and Word2Vec, where, where you can take your document corpus, you can run them through Glove, and you can get nice embeddings that you then can run um, predictive models. In fact, your predictive models can use uh, uh, you know, LibLinear, SVM, or, or GlimNet. Uh, it's Glove. Glove in particular was a RNN that was used to solve for the embedding values. So um, with the embeddings, each document is, is represented as a sequence of vector M. So this, in this it's five, but in Glove you can, you can pick the number of vectors you want. Um, so then you limit each document to the last L word. So, so each page um, in, 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 in an RNN, each, each document has to be the same length to, to stream through at the same time. And so there's a bunch of padding has to happen on anything that isn't the longest length document. In time series, it's not a big deal because everything is usually the same length in time. But in, in documents, there's there's a bunch of zero padding that has to happen. Oh, here's a good picture. Um, so in, in document classification, then um, those document series of that length get processed and processed sequence, sequentially from left to right. Um, a parallel series of hidden activation vectors, the A that we saw up above is created for each and every document. A feeds the output layer to produce the evolving prediction O. So, so this is a, a, a typical RNN as it's deployed. Um, they mention here, and I've seen the time series, they're, they're uh, our, our canned LSTM. So LSTM is an RNN, but it addresses a, 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 a problem. The long short-term memory, um, the, the issue is for deep series, if, if you've got hundreds or thousands of points, it, it turns out the U values way back in time wash out to very close to zero. They, they have almost no influence. And if you've got um, seasonal data or things that come up like on holidays, you, it, 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 it isn't the best possible model only to use you know, a, a sequentially this way. So LSTMs have a, an added feature where there are a longer and short-term um, say recurring loops, you end up with some of both. So it ends up being yet another hyperparameter. With two tracks of hidden layer activations. So when, when the first activation is computed, it gets input from hidden units, both um, you know, one back in time, but also much further back in time. All right. So, and then here's another example of time series forecasting where we're looking at stock trading volumes, this, this uh, top series. 
the log of trading volumes of a given stock. And um, they, they note here in the graph this phenomenon of autocorrelation, which we cover in a time series book, but um, they, they are not, the, 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 the time series itself is not independent. Um, that is the, the, the time series is somewhat dependent on its most recent value. Um, it's just a, a, a natural, it's, it's what happens in time series. And because it's not independent, um, the, the, the assumptions we make in, in other uh, algorithms don't, don't hold up here very well. So um, RNNs handle this um, uh, very nicely, this, this feature where um, that U weighting is, is available with, with every step in time is a, is, is a, is, is a very nice feature. Um, okay, so in their case here, they're actually doing the prediction on the lag. Um, and they put in three vectors, each consisting of the three measurements, uh, log training, uh, a, a independent Dow Jones return value and a volatility value, price volatility. And uh, this hyperparameter, the, the lag hyperparameter, they're noting here, um, this also should be chosen with care. If you use a lag window uh, to move over time, uh, your model will be very sensitive to your choice of lag. Uh, the last point they hear about, uh, make here about autoregression. Um, as you see in other texts in time series, the, um, um, they're, they're, the, this, I don't know, ARIMA models, I guess, do you recall ARIMA models? So I, I see, Ricardo, you're nodding. Yes, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in fact, ARIMA, that AR is from autoregression. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, so right. um, this modeling has some features in common with ARIMA. They use the same response and the same input sequences. And um, e even the weights, um, they're, they, they, they both exist in ARIMA models and in RNNs. Um, it's just the ARIMA model simply treats every element of the sequence equally as a vector of, of this L by P uh, uh, parameter space. Um, and, and that would effectively be a, a flat neural network. But the RNN can multiple hidden layers. So it, it, the RNN has a way of finding, discovering additional nonlinearity and um, you know, combinations of features. If, if, if there's some sort of exponential relationship or multiplicative relationship between these regressors, the, the RNN is capable of finding that where the, where the ARIMA will not be. Hold, hold on a second. All right, um, coming up last three minutes, just, just a quick note on when to use deep learning. I think, I think Ricardo, you, 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 you'd outline the high points here. Um, the authors, chin, um, you know, when the signal to noise ratio is high um, and it's worth the time to tune all these hyperparameters, then, then building the model is, is useful. Uh, but, but if you've got noisy data, and, and maybe a lot less data that they're, they are saying, use, use the more conventional models. Um, I'll, I'll pause there because we're, uh, we're almost out of time. Um, we've got uh, uh, the dissent uh, comment to make. And uh, I started many of the exercises. I, I'd 
love to go through the um, the torch lab. Um, so can we do that next week? Yep. We're, yeah. we're good with that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I will uh, I'll see you all next week then. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Great. Have, great, have great a great talk, day. Jim. Great talk. Great thank talk. You. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.